Welcome back to Z Physics. Today we are going to be talking about star formation. How is a star actually born? Well, it all begins with a cloud of interstellar dust. There are multiple, multiple interstellar clouds that are forming stars at the moment as we speak. They consist mostly of hydrogen and these hydrogen particles are going to be experiencing a gravitational force. In fact, they are going to be an undergoing a gravitational collapse. They will be drawn together to the center of gravity. Now, as the gravitational collapse occurs, gravitational potential energy is being directly converted to kinetic energy. Now, remember, the kinetic energy of a particle is proportional to its temperature. In fact, the kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves times Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. So as that kinetic energy rises, because gravitational potential energy is being turned into kinetic energy, so does the temperature. So in fact, as this interstellar dust cloud is experiencing a gravitational collapse, its temperature is rising. Now, as this interstellar cloud is collapsing further and further, the temperature is rising faster and faster, and the temperature is continuously increasing. Now, when the temperature hits somewhere just below 10 to the power of 7 kelvins, something remarkable occurs. Suddenly, the hydrogen nuclei have enough energy to actually fuse together and form helium. This is known as a thermonuclear reaction. And then a star is born. Why do we need that incredibly high temperature? Well, if we think about it, if we have two nuclei of hydrogen, we have a proton here, certainly we have another proton uh, over here, that we want to repel because of the Coulomb electrostatic repulsion. So the only way to get them close enough to actually fuse is to uh, have them have incredibly high kinetic energy, which only happens at very, very extreme temperatures, somewhere very, very close to about 10 to a power of 7 kelvins. As soon as this thermonuclear reaction occurs, a star is born. Each thermonuclear reaction, we actually have a conversion of pure mass into pure energy. And this works in perfect accordance with Einstein's famous equation, delta E is equal to delta mc squared. So we have that conversion of mass directly into energy. This is what actually sustains the radiation pressure inside of a star. So suddenly the collapse of the um, of the interstellar cloud or the, uh, the, the protostar as it's known, the, uh, the star just before uh, the ignition of thermonuclear reaction stops we suddenly achieve a balance in which we have gravity trying to squash the star, trying to compress the star, and we have radiation pressure from the thermonuclear reactions keeping the star in balance. The star then enters the main sequence of its life cycle in which it's uh, fusing hydrogen, into helium and that's producing radiation pressure which opposes the gravitational force. Now what happens next is determined by the mass, by the initial mass of the star. Now let's have a look into the typical life cycle of a star with a mass similar to that of our sun. So as the sun is shining happily every day. We may not see it every day. It's a bit cloudy today. However, it is constantly fusing hydrogen into helium. Eventually, all stars run out of fuel. Now, when this happens to a sun, it needs to fuse heavier elements into even heavier elements. Now, in order to do so, it requires more kinetic energy and requires more temperature. As the 
fuel essentially runs out, the collapse when the star will initially collapse even further, converting even more of that gravitational potential energy into thermal energy. Now, as it does that, the temperature in the core increases by a very, very large amount, allowing the star to fuse heavier elements. When this happens, the outer layers cool down and expand, just like an ideal gas. When they do expand, they turn the star into a red giant. So this is the next phase in the evolution of a star with a mass similar to that of our sun. So this is the next phase that is awaiting our sun. After this stage is complete, the star will eventually collapse. Gravity will win. Now, it will then turn into a white dwarf. Now, this is another type of a star, and in every star, the radiation pressure is provided by a, uh, by a different method. For instance, the radiation pressure in the main sequence star was provided by fusing hydrogen into helium. In a red giant, it's being provided by fusing heavier elements into even heavier elements. Now, in a white dwarf, when um, we apply even greater forces of gravitational collapse, what is actually stopping a white dwarf to collapse even further is a phenomenon known as electron degeneracy pressure degeneracy pressure actually stems fundamentally from quantum mechanics. There's a principle called the Pauli exclusion principle which says that no two electrons can have the same quantum numbers. In other words, they cannot occupy the same space. Now this is what is actually causing the radiation pressure in a white dwarf star. It is electron degeneracy pressure. The very fact that you squeeze matter so close together that the actual individual electrons are providing that radiation pressure. So it's gravity being in balance with the electron degeneracy pressure of the individual electrons inside of the white dwarf. Now this will only work though if the mass of the star is below 1.4 solar masses. This is known as the Chandrasekhar limit, and it sets the limit of a mass of a white dwarf. If the star has a mass which is greater than 1.4 solar masses, something really, really interesting occurs. If the mass is below 1.4 solar masses, the, uh, the star will be a white dwarf virtually almost forever. Now, let's have a look at what happens when we exceed that initial mass of 1.4 solar masses. The evolution of a star considerably more massive than the sun is absolutely fascinating. Let's have a look. Now, when a more massive star runs out of hydrogen fuel, it will then turn into a red supergiant. So, very, very similarly, uh, similarly to a less massive star, it's run out of hydrogen, so it's going to start fusing heavier elements, and it will be in a brief red supergiant phase. Now, straight after that, it will actually undergo one of the most violent events that, um, that we can observe in the universe, which are supernovas. Now, a supernova is caused by the instant gravitational collapse of a red supergiant star and has two outcomes, depending on the initial mass of the star. If a star is not so much on the heavier side, it will turn into a neutron star. Now, a neutron star are, or neutron stars are the densest, most um, interesting gravitational objects in the universe that are not black holes. So, a, in a neutron star, the radiation pressure that's 
balancing out the uh, the gravitational force is actually provided by neutron degeneracy pressure. Keeping in mind that uh, neutrons do not like uh, occupying the, the same space exactly the same way that electrons do not and they provide electron degeneracy pressure in a white dwarf. Now if the star is even larger though it will gravity will win. Eventually gravity will win and it will form an object known as a black hole in which that mass of a gigantic star will collapse into a singularity forming a black hole which are some of the most interesting objects in the universe okay folks so this is the uh, birth and life of a star um, essentially in a nutshell hopefully you've enjoyed that if there are any questions please feel free to drop a comment down below and please consider subscribing thank you